Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well, and welcome to this night-ending bonus upload before we jump into it a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost you a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads that I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to this night ending bonus upload, shall we? This night ending bonus is just something I put together with some information that I have compiled and a couple of uh, theories that I had kicking around and I wanted to share it with you. All right, folks. So for the last six years of this channel, I have been sharing encounters and research that I've done on attacks and so on. And we've kind of all had our theories of where or what even dogmen are. Um, you know, periodically I get new subscribers that email me, look into the cinecephaly. Well, I've been doing this for 20 something years. I've read all about the cinecephaly and, um, you know, and, and I appreciate that. It's, it's something that's not new to many of us. Um, but when someone first reads about it, it's like mind blowing for them. Uh, and then there's that possibility of um, them being possibly some genetic offshoot of the Neanderthal. Um, I've talked about that a couple of different times. Well, Today, I kind of want to combine all of that. Uh, I'm hopefully going to have a, a person that I was just a couple of days introduced to uh, on this channel. And his research is into the biblical um, kind of... Biblical research on the floods and creation, the Nephilim, the fallen ones, this and that. And, uh, you know, he did a really great upload about dogmen and the Nephilim. And I watched his video and, um, you know, it was... A ton of information that had been compiled information that I've shared on the channel that others have shared on the channel but then with his look on the religious kind of aspect you know a lot of cryptozoologists don't look deep into that they say they do but that's not their forte this gentleman's forte is the Christian kind of uh, history, the best way I can think of it. So hopefully in the next couple of days, I'll have him on and he'll be able to share a lot of information with us. Not about the dogmen, but about, about things like um, the fallen ones, the floods, the this and the that, the, the things that, you know, people just want to know a little more on and um i was 
blown away on one thing that he said, one key thing that he said, and uh, it was the Nephilim. Now, we all view the Nephilim as these giants, right? But because that's what we're told it's actually translated into, but it's not only translated into giant, but it's also translated into fallen ones too. Um, there's a couple of different translations and which you can, you can look into. I, I looked into it myself cause I was like, oh, I never heard that. And I did. And I was like, Whoa. So that made me kind of look back at a couple of other videos that I've done. I've did videos on, you know, St. Christopher about a year and a half ago. I re-uploaded it about six months ago. Um, videos on the Cynocephaly three, four years ago. Um, you know, just a lot of information that was never just put together and really made us think more, you know? Um, so that's what I kind of want to do, but I wanted to share this with you guys first. This is a scientific thing that I've shared before, but by sharing this and then sharing the information I compiled for the last couple of days, I'm almost wondering if, well, you, you guys will see. I'm almost wondering if these dog men were like a nomadic tribe that had turned away from God and that was, you know, punished or if they had become offspring from the fallen angels and the human woman um, or if by chance, you know, because we already know that cavemen existed, right? Cavemen exist well before Christ walked on this planet. If you think about the logistics and the time you know, time, whatever, you know, Christ supposedly walked the planet 2020 something years ago. Cavemen that we are finding, you know, remnants of were hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, so was there kind of like this thing before Christ? Maybe. Yeah. Who knows? I don't know. I'm not an expert, but from information hundreds of thousands of years ago to information 2,000 years ago, things are really starting to fit together. So I want to share this with you, get your opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But is there really a way of proving right or wrong? These creatures may be interdimensional. How do we know God can't God didn't create, well, obviously, if there is this omnipresent, you know, being that I believe in, then he created this earth and all the other, he created everything, right? So if he created these interdimensional worlds, that means he created what's over there. I don't, I, I just, it's, once you start going down these rabbit holes, it gets real, real touchy. And I'm not, I'm just kind of blown away. Um, this wasn't even going to be tonight's upload. I actually just an hour and a half ago, two hours ago, talked to a uh, correctional officer for almost two hours about something that went down that I'm going to share with you guys probably tomorrow um, out of Alabama. Blew me away. But anyway, I want to share this with you guys. So I'm just going to stop rambling and I'm going to get into the juicy details. All right. So this is the scientific, um, 
thesis uh, from a man. His last name is Van Drimini. He wrote a wonderful book um, that I have and I've read about, I don't know, 50 times. His name is Danny Van Drimini. The book is called Them and Us, How Neanderthal Predation Created Modern Humans. So I'm going to share this and then we'll get into some other crazy things. And I really just, I, every human culture has believed in the existence of other beings, monstrous, humanoid, sapient, but inhuman. They have gone by different names, boogeyman, bugbear, cyclops, giant, junt, ogre, omni, troll, yeti, bigfoot, dogman, and more. But they're always feared lurkers in the shadows, threats to the clan, tribe, and hearth. Dungeons and Dragons did not create these monsters, and despite ongoing controversies, they don't represent anything modern. Humanity's legendary heroes have been fighting these monsters since time immemorial. The real question is why? Why does every civilization have similar myths? Why does every culture have legends of monstrous humanoids? And why are they always depicted as fearsome? and dangerous because legends are real so this kind of article shows what modern mainstream the mainstream view of the caveman is and it's what we all are told <clears throat> but Van Drimini scientifically broke everything down and he broke that wall. Um, it wasn't just, it was just, you know, 10 years ago that science and scientists didn't even talk about uh, warring clans of Neanderthal Denisovians, you know, Supposedly, they were just hunters, never warring, but that's not true. So, Van Drimini shows that Neanderthals were apex predators. Analysis of isotopes of Bone College has shown Neanderthals' diet was 97% meat. They were estimated to have eaten 4.1 pounds of fresh meat a day. Uh from the bones littered in their caves, we know Neanderthals hunted woolly mammoth, giant cave bear, woolly rhinoceros, bison, wolves, and even cave lions, possibly using stone-tipped wooden spears. Neanderthals were cannibals. A number of Neanderthal sites reveal bones that have been cut and cracked open to extract marrow. While this hypothesis was initially rejected, a recent find at El Cidron in Spain revealed numerous Neanderthal skeletons with unmistakable marks of butchery by cannibals wielding hand axes, knives, and scrapers. Neanderthals had more robust bones, a heavier, muscul a heavier musculature than Homo sapiens. They weighed 25% more. They were so heavily muscled that their skeletons had to develop extra thick bones one of the most characteristic features of Neanderthal was its exaggerated massiveness of their trunk and limb bones. All of the preserved bones suggest a strength seldom obtained by modern man. Um, quoting paleoanthropologist Eric Trinkus. So this is a paleoanthropologist that said this, named Eric Trinkus. A healthy Neanderthal male could lift an average NFL linebacker over his head, throw him through a goalpost. Neanderthals also evolved extremely thick skulls, postcranial hyperrobustity that protected them in close quarter confrontations with prey. Um, they all had a kyphosis with hunched backs that gave them a distinct profile and gait. Neanderthal teeth were twice as large as humans and sharp, according to a 2008 anthropologist resource. 
Their mouths could open much wider than a human mouth, enabling them to take extremely large bites. Judging by the size of their jaw, they had a tremendous bite force. Neanderthals evolved in the Ice Age in Europe and had specific adaptations. Um, large noses, compact torso. Most importantly, they were covered in thick fur. Since no Neanderthal cadaver survives, this point cannot be proven. But Van Drimini points out that every primate except Homo sapiens is covered with fur. And that every cold adapted mammal during the Ice Age had thick fur, including mammals that are now hairless in Africa, such as the elephant and the rhinoceros. There is no reason to believe Neanderthals were hairless except for our desire for them to look like us. Um, the only way Neanderthals could have survived in the Ice Age without fur was if they made thick protective clothes. Archaeologist Mark White points out Neanderthal clothing would have needed to be more than a ragged loincloth of popular depiction. Some form of tailoring would have been required, but Neanderthal sites have yielded no evidence of needlecraft technology. They were not making clothes because they had fur. So, we're talking about super strength, a hunch, a gait, large teeth, and a lot of fur. Neanderthals, this is where things get real interesting. Neanderthal, Neanderthal skulls had extremely large eye sockets, suggesting very large eyes. That, in turn, suggests Neanderthal were nocturnal. However, the large eyes pose a problem in the Ice Age. Europe uh, would have presented Neanderthals with blinding sunlight reflected off the snow. Van der Rimini suggests that Neanderthals had vertically aligned slit pupils, which enabled them to use the full diameter of the lens in low light while shutting out bright light by day. Nocturnal primates, such as the Reus monkey and the owl monkey, all have large eyes with vertically aligned slit pupil. Van Germany suggests Neanderthal also had a tapetum lucidum like a cat that made their eyes shine in the dark and had a dark scarilla like other primates. Neanderthals had a distinct facial proganthicism that featured broad noses. Van Drimini argues that this suggests Neanderthal snout with a dog-like nose designed for scent hunting. This was useful during nocturnal raids. Okay, here we are now stepping over the line of the Neanderthal looking like Fred Flintstone, which obviously humanity wants them to, um, because hell, that'd be a lot easier for us to, rather than this super strong dog-like creature with a lot of fur that hunted Homo sapiens back in the day. Pretty crazy, right? Neanderthals did not speak. He quotes in September of 2008, taught presented to the American Association of Physical Anthropologists. Their large nasal cavity would have decreased the intelligibility of vowel-like sounds. The combination of their long face, short neck, unequally proportioned vocal tract, large nose made it highly unlikely that Neanderthals would have been unable to produce quantal speech. Neanderthals' tongues were also not shaped to speak clearly overall. The evidence suggests the creature that spoke with a deep timber and lots of guttural grunts and sounds. I, we are now listening to this scientist or this man of science describing what people have encountered dogmen describe word for word. <laughs> um, the Neanderthal that Vendrimini describes is thus a terrifying creature. 
A hunched cannibalistic predator with large shining eyes, a animalistic snout covered by thick fur, massive muscles built for close combat, hunting by night with a brutish and guttural voice, a huge mouth with huge teeth and powerful jaws. It did not look like Fred Flintstone. That, my friends, is an orc or a bugbear, an ogre, a dogman. Whatever it is, it's been appearing in our myths and legends for thousands of years. It's the great enemy. So, that, he describes this dogman creature. Minus a tail, but we're not talking. He didn't mention tail, but who knows? I mean... He mentioned a dog-like snout. Now, obviously, I brought up the Cenocephaly, and um, if these these creatures in 80,000 years ago, 80,000 years ago, there was a bottleneck in modern man. We almost, de we declined to such a small amount of human or modern human what we know as us now back then 80,000 years ago and it wasn't because a meteor hit it wasn't because we ran out of food it was because of a Neanderthal war a war with human and Neanderthal and we won eventually but they almost kicked our ass and it's scientifically proven these are things you can look up I'm you can read this book this book tells it all. Or you can Google it. Um, a guy, and I'm only saying this really quick, because a guy said when I did the upload about the FBI uh, photographer that was found dead in North Carolina, uh, Nanahala, um, he said, where's, where's the documented proof? And I said, Google it. It's all there. I'm just sharing the info from Google with you, brother. Um, you know, this is things that is proven. The book, Them and Us, how Neanderthal predation uh, created modern humans by Danny Van Drimini. Get the book. It's an amazing book. I'm not getting anything out of that. I'm not his salesman. But I bought the book, and I've read the book a bunch of times, and it's truly amazing. Um, so, right, if there was this war, there'd have to be warring tribes of modern human and Neanderthal, these creatures that looked like Danny Van Drimini describes. What does that almost sound like? Like these tri tribes of Cynocephaly, right? These tribes of Cynocephaly... Around 400 to 500 BC, Greek physician Tesisus wrote the following passage, translated to English to Greek. On these, the Indian mountains, there lived men with the head of dog, whose clothing was the skin of wild beasts. They spoke no language, but barked like dogs. And in this manner, make themselves understood by each other. Their teeth were larger than those of dogs. Their nails were those of animals, but longer and rounder. They inhabited the mountains as far as the river Indus. Their complexion was swarthy. They, they are extremely just, like the rest of the Indians with whom they associate. They understand the, Ingli the Indian language, but are unable to converse, only barking and making signs with their hands and fingers by way of reply. They live on raw meat, and they number about 120,000. The Cynocephaly, living on the mountains, do not practice any trade, but live by hunting. When they have killed an animal, they roast it in the sun. They also rear numbers of sheep, goat, and asses, drinking the milk of the sheep and whey made from it. They eat the fruit of the Cyptocora, hence amber is procured since it is sweet. They also dry it and keep it in baskets, as the Greeks keep their dried grapes. They make rafts, which they load with fruit together, 
with well-cleaned purple flowers and 260 talents of ember. Amber, with the same quality of purple dye and 1,000 additional ten talents of amber, which they send annually to the king of India, they exchange the rest for bread, flour, and cotton stuffs with Indians, for whom they also buy swords for hunting wild beast, bow and arrow, being very skillful in drawing the bow and hurling a spear. They cannot be defeated in war since they inhabit lofty and accessible mountains. Every five years, the king sends them a present of 300,000 bows, as many spears, 120,000 shields, and 50,000 swords. Van Drimini points out in that article that they hunted with spears. Do you see what I'm... I'm just putting it together. You know, um, it's it's truly... It blew me away because I, 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 I read this. I had shared this information before. And I've shared that. But I've never shared it together. And I've never put it together like this. Which blew me away because I was like... The information was sitting right in front of you, you dumbass. And this is what I mean by puzzle pieces. I've saved this. I've saved this article. I saved this article. I saved that information. Maybe it didn't fit. I saved this information. I didn't think this fit, but it does. They do not live in homes, but caves. They set out for the cave. They set out for the chase with bows and spears, and as they are very swift of foot, they pursue and soon overtake their quarry. The women have a bath once a month, and the men do not have a bath at all, but only wash their hands. They anoint themselves three times a month with oil made from milk and wipe themselves with skins. The clothes of men and women alike are not skins with hair, with the hair on, but skins tanned and very fine. The richest wear linen clothes, but they are few in number. They have no bed, but sleep on leaves or grass. He who possesses the greatest number of sheep is considered the richest, and so in regard to their own possessions, all both men and women have tails above their hips like dogs but longer and more hairier. They are just, they live longer than any other man, 170, sometimes 200 years. So here's what I'm just thinking, you know, this bottleneck war broke out. These creatures that we possibly, Danny Van Dermany calls Neanderthal, moved just just pushed away i mean he describes them as living in mountainous regions hunting cave animals you know so makes sense so they move and they but they eventually come out of these mountains and they watch the people and they start to trade with the people because they can see hey you well, maybe we got our asses kicked let's just befriend and learn you know I'm, I'm not guessing that these Cynocephali came up with building rafts by themselves. I'm guessing they learned these from modern human. Makes sense. The great Marco Polo mentioned Cynocephali indirectly while describing his travels to an island of Anagamenan. Anagamenan is a very large island. The people are without a king and are idolaters and had and know better than wild beasts. And I assure you, all the men of this island have heads of dogs and teeth and eyes likewise. In fact, in the face, they are all like big mastiff dogs. They have a quantity of spice, but they are most cruel generation and eat everybody that they catch, if not their own race. So, 
Greek physician Tisius talks about them having these purple flowers and this amber and this and that and trading. Marco Polo somewhat. So Marco Polo was 12, 13 hundreds. He was like born in 1258, died in 1334. So 1300 years. If we go by BC AD, 1300, uh, Tusius was 400 to 500 BC. So we'll just say 1600 years apart. Cetaceous or Tusius or however you want to say it. C-T-E-S-I-S-I-A-S. Tusius. Um... There was, there was a large gap. There was 1,600 years difference. A lot could have happened between the time that Cetesius wrote this. They were docile and just and traded with these Greeks and this and that and did this. and To the time when Marco Polo connected up with these dog-headed men. When they were probably just like, hey, you know what? You guys screwed us over. We're sick of it. We don't want any part of you. Maybe their numbers went from 120,000 to 10,000, 12,000. Who knows? But they were pissed. So now we're talking ages and ages. And then I got to thinking... After I listened to um, my new friend, he was talking about possibly dogmen being Nephilim. And I was like, yeah, maybe. But Nephilim are giants, right? Well, no. Giants or Nephilim was translated in two different ways, I guess. Um, but did mean fallen ones or... Uh, Children of fallen ones. So who's to say that when these fallen angels bred with human woman, these creatures weren't created? You know? And then that brings us to like the depiction of St. Christopher. And when he's on, I'll have him describe more of what that is. Because I've done uploads about that and I've shared the information. But he's got more of a religious kind of view on it. And once again, it's... He's going to share information that's out there for us to read and look at. Uh, I've shared it, but he's got a different kind of part. He's got a different look at it, a different take on it, you know. Um, but I found this. I found this, and it was pretty friggin' interesting. Um, why would they depict St. Christopher as a dog-headed man. Well, if Nephilim means children of the fallen one or giant, supposedly St. Christopher was a giant. He was 12 cubits or 18 feet tall. So, and he was supposedly from... Uh, where were the Can Canaanites? He was like of Canaanite descent. So maybe just like out of a misread or a mistranslate, they say, okay, he's a giant, he's a Nephilim from Canaanite descent. Or did they, you know, he's a canine. He's a canine like giant. We don't know. But there's a lot of information out there. No one really knows because we weren't there. We only know. I mean, unless we break into the Vatican and we we start reading their books on the floor in their library and drink a ton of espresso. But I found this. Uh, before his baptism was named Reprobus. But afterwards, he was named Christopher, which is as much to say as bearing Christ. Of that he bore 
Christ in four manners. He bear him on his shoulders by conveying and leading, in his body by making it lean, in mind of by devotion, and in his mouth by confession and prediction. The idea that Christopher bear Christ on his shoulders is the most popular story about the saint and the one that gave him his role as the patron saint of travelers. Here is the version told in the Golden Legend. Christopher sought out a hermit to be instructed in faith, and the hermit asked him to serve God through fasting. Christopher asked if there was another way. The hermit suggested waking and making many prayers, but Christopher didn't like that any better. And so the hermit told the giant Christopher, who was 12 cubits or 18 feet tall, to serve God by carrying passengers across the dangerous river. This was acceptable. And there he abode thus, doing many days, and in the time, as he slept in his lodge, he heard the voice of a child, which called him, and said, Christopher, come out and bear me over. When he awoke and went out, but found no man. And when he was again in his house, he heard the same voice, and ran out and found nobody the third time. He was called and came hither, and found a child beside the rivage of the river, which prayed him goodly to bear him over the water. And then Christopher lifted up the child on his shoulders and took his staff and entered into the river for the pass. And the water of the river arose and swelled more and more, and the child was heavy as lead. And all way as he went further, the water increased and grew more. The child more and more waxed heavy insomuch that Christopher had great anguish, anguish and was afraid to be drowned. And when he was escaped with great pain and passed the water, he set the child aground. He said to the child, Child, thou hast put me in great peril. Thou wast, wait almost as I had the world upon me. I might bear no greater burden, and the child answered, Christopher, marvel thee nothing, for thou hast not only borne all the world upon thee, but thou hast borne him that created and made all the world upon thy shoulders. I am Jesus Christ the King, to whom thou servest in his work. So, then there's this. Uh, little is known of St. Christopher's life. The martyr killed under religious persecution uh, from the Roman Emperor Decisus. The most famous tale in his tales tells of a time he carried a child, a stranger to him across the river, he brought the child safely to the shore to the other side. The child revealed to himself to revealed himself to Saint Christopher as Christ. This legend earned Saint Christopher the patronage of travelers, and small images and icons of him are often worn by Catholics or kept on hand while traveling. Some of these depictions of Saint Christopher are famous for one thing, depicting him with the head of a dog, most often seen in iconography from the Eastern churches. According to a narrative, St. Christopher was once named Reprotus, Reprobus, captured in combat against tribes dwelling to the west of Egypt. He was a member of the Marmar Asia Barba tribe. A characteristic of the tribe reportedly was being enormous in size with the head of a dog rather than that of a man. The medieval Irish passion of St. Christopher says similar. This Christopher was one of the dogheads, a race 
that had heads of dog and ate human flesh, reflecting a brief belief in Cynocephaly, the idea that a race of dog-headed people inhabited the world, the most likely conclusion um, is what I said, the Byzantine mistranslation of the Latin, Canis, Canaanite. Uh, but, I mean, it's what you believe, right? It's what we what we believe. Could they have gotten it wrong? Yeah, they could have. But he was also noted as a giant, so they didn't get that wrong. How do you get that wrong? You can't, because he's not only depicted with the head of a dog, which I see, you could have gotten that wrong, you know, translation-wise. But he was never, you know, you can't get the translation mixed up by him being 12 cubits high, 18 feet. Who knows? I'm going to have this conversation with, with this uh, gentleman that I cannot wait to have on, Aridan. Um, But I was just thinking about this, you know? Like I the Danny Van Drimini and then the Cinecephaly. Things that I've shared multiple times on this channel. You know, there's over 2,600 videos on this channel. I've talked about Cinecephaly, made probably 10 different videos on them, probably four or five on St. Christopher. Talked about Danny Vendrimini three or four times, you know. But here's that thing. Once again, I'm going to go back. How I always say, guys, there is no experts. And if you hear something, take it. Take the information. Even if you don't agree with it now, you might agree with it later. I didn't know what I thought about the Dan Van Danny Van Drim anything. I liked it. I thought that was an amazing. The Cynocephaly kind of put it away. But then I started to think about everything. And I was like, wait a second. This is all starting to fit together. It's all going together like a Rubik's Cube. Just my theory, you know? Once again, like I said, it's just a little theory that I had kicking around some ideas. Just thought I'd share it. You know, with everything that we've been talking about and sharing on this channel, things are really looking the way, biblically, the way it, it, uh, it seems that we are at the precipice or at the beginning of the end of times. I myself don't believe that it is going to be anytime soon. I think things are going to get a heck of a lot worse before it ends. Just anyway, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. After all, it is your support that helps the channel to continue to grow and go. And what gives us all a place to share our experiences and theories judgment free simply treated with the respect that we all deserve. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.